All right, let's go ahead and get started with some housekeeping things. Um, welcome to ASMI's sixth edition of the Masterclass webinar. We're excited to be here. I'm Kathleen McKeown. For those of you who don't know me, I am a hand surgeon here at Andrews. Uh, my co-moderator tonight will be Norman Waldrop, our, one of our foot surgeons or foot and ankle surgeons. He will be joining us shortly. He's uh, on his way home from work and is going to log on as soon as he can. Uh, we are particularly proud to introduce you to two of our new orthopedic surgeons, Christopher Beaumont, who is joining me in Handland. There's nobody more thrilled than I am to have some help in Handland. And I know Norman is equally thrilled to have Dr. Pitts, uh, who is providing some help in foot and ankle land. Um, we're excited to hear from them tonight. Um, the remainder of our faculty do not have any disclosures. Um, so now we can go ahead and meet our faculty. Our first presenter will be Dr. Beaumont. He um, is here at Andrews with me, like I said, in Handland. He went to medical school at University of Louisville. He then did his residency at UAB and went for his hand fellowship at Florida Orthopedic Institute in Tampa. He is going to present acute collateral ligament injuries of the thumb today, which is, you know, we of course think is a good topic. He will be joined by Kramer Hodges. He is the Director of Occupational Therapy at Therapy South. He's been fabulous to work with. He is a certified hand therapist. Um, he earned his BS in kinesiology from Mississippi State and then went to UAB for occupational therapy school. And as I said, is now a certified hand therapist and we're thrilled to have him here with us. Dr. Pitts uh, is, has joined Dr. Waldrop in Foot and Ankle World uh, and we're again very happy to have him. He went to medical school at Wake Forest he also did residency at UAB and was in the same class as Dr. Beaumont. He then went to Ortho Carolina in Charlotte, North Carolina for his foot and ankle fellowship. He is going to present on Liz Frank injuries today, including rehab and return to play considerations. Um, so with that introduction, everybody welcome. And we're gonna turn it over to Dr. Beaumont for discussion. All righty. Well, I'm Chris. Thank you for the warm welcome, everyone. Thank you for uh, spending your evening with us. Excited to have you guys here. Um, so kind of a quick uh, overline um, objectives uh, for this. We're going to go through the anatomy, how to evaluate this, how to image it, and how to diagnose these injuries. We're going to describe how to go through a technically sound repair and then how to safely rehab and return these patients in a timely manner. Um, so the thumb MCP joint is a uh, cartilage covered condylate joint. Uh, the base of the proximal phalanx, as you all know, hinges over a dome shaped metacarpal head. And this has a, a reasonably variable uh, radius of curvature. And uh, as an extension of that, there's a very wide variety of native mobility. Some people have a lot of motion through their MCP joints, others do not. Um, I personally fall into the uh, reasonably uh, stiff category there. I have less than about 45 degrees of flexion through my thumb MCP joint. Uh, but due to the shape, it relies very heavily on the collateral ligaments for stability, those being the ulnar collateral ligament and the radial collateral ligament. Um, and as you all know, the uh, other finger MCP joints are lax in extension and stable in flexion for grasp. However, the thumb must maintain the stability in both flexion and extension, so it really relies on those uh, ligaments quite heavily. Um, so for the proper uh, UCL ligament, it's a thick band measuring anywhere between four and eight millimeters wide, about 12 to 14 millimeters in length. And when you think about it, four to eight millimeters is a pretty substantially sized ligament when you think in comparison of how small these bones really are. Um, it originates from the dorsal ulnar aspect of the metacarpal head, travels distal and palmar, and inserts on the proximal uh, aspect and the uh, palmar and ulnar aspect of the uh, phalanx there. Uh, there are two distinct bundles. The proper UCL bundle gives you kind of your maximum stability at 30 degrees of flexion. The accessory UCL is a little proximal, little volar, and inserts onto the volar plate and gives you a little bit of a stability and full extension. Um, so it's always helpful to know where these ligaments originate um, and insert for your repairs and acute injuries, as well as in uh, reconstruction and chronic injuries. This is uh, kind of much akin to all of the anatomic studies for the collateral ligaments in the elbow and cruciate ligaments in the knee and so forth. Um, so for the UCL, you don't really need to remember all of these exact numbers, but if you kind of remember that roughly one third of the distance from the dorsal metacarpal surface for the origin and roughly one quarter of the distance from the palmar surface of the proximal phalanx for the insertion, um, that'll keep you in pretty good shape. Um, so for the RCL, um, the other side of the thumb, uh, this sounds awfully familiar and looks awfully familiar, right? 
It's about the same size, travels in roughly the same direction, and also similarly has a proper and accessory bundle as well. Um, although not exactly identical to the UCL, it is pretty close. And again, you don't have to remember the exact numbers, but if you remember roughly a third of the distance from the dorsal metacarpal surface and roughly one quarter of the distance from the palmar surface of the uh, proximal phalanx, you'll be in good shape. Um, so a little bit of history, a little bit of epidemiology. We in the handroll are quite the eponymous group of individuals. Uh, so in 1955, Dr. Campbell, an orthopedic surgeon, observed Scottish gamekeepers who developed this kind of chronic valgus instability after having to humanely put these rabbits down and carry their game home. Uh, so that's where we get the gamekeeper's thumb name from. Um, in 1962, in a JBJS article, Dr. Stenner, who was a Swedish surgeon, uh, described the anatomy and treatment of displaced ulnar collateral ligament injuries, uh, where this ligament would become stuck proximal to the adductor aponeurosis, and this would prevent it from healing without non-operative treatment. Um, and then lastly, in uh, 1976, Dr. Brown from the Cleveland Clinic um, published a paper, Ski Pole Thumb Injuries, and largely gets credit for the skier's thumb or the acute UCL injury. Uh, so for a little bit of epidemiology on this, uh, UCL injuries are pretty common. Uh, it's the most common injury to the thumb MCP joint, has an incidence of about 50 per 100,000. And it's, from some papers, it is uh, reported as being involved in about 86% of thumb MCP joint injuries. Um, on the other side, RCL injuries are a little bit less common compared to the uh, ulnar collateral ligament injury. And if you look at the papers, it's somewhere between 10 and 42%. But I'd say maybe for every 10 of these injuries that I see um, in total, I'd say eight of those are UCL and maybe two of them are RCLs. Um, so how do these patients present to clinic? They usually complain of a little bit of thumb pain around the MCP joint. It'll be swollen. You need to make sure that you check the joint above and below, make sure that you're not missing anything. Um, and there's generally a traumatic event or a particular game that they're able to pinpoint. Um, they'll often uh, play through the game after, you know, sliding into a base and sustaining this injury, hitting an opposing player's helmet. Uh, they'll expect that it'll kind of get better throughout the game or they'll make it through another practice or a batting practice. And I feel like the majority of them show up a couple of days later when it really hasn't gotten better and that's when they're seeking care. Um, the patients usually can find that they lack grip strength and it hurts to hold something. Uh, but I don't generally hear someone coming in saying that they can't pinch anything or that they have a grossly unstable thumb themselves. Um, so when you're looking at them in clinic, you need to look at the resting position of both of their thumbs next to each other. Are they reasonably similar or one of their thumbs drifting off to the side? Uh, where's their swelling? Where's their area of tenderness? Is there a palpable fullness somewhere, uh, you know, such as a stenter lesion proximal to the joint? Um, if you suspect one of these injuries, you need to test their varus and valgus stability. And I think it's always really, really helpful to examine the other uninjured side <clears throat> just to get an idea of what their normal is. Uh, there are some patients who are really, really stiff, and there are some patients who are very, very mobile, and that is just how they are built. Um, is there any variation in the angulation between these sides? But I think most importantly, um, is there a firm endpoint uh, when you're testing these ligaments, or does the thumb just keep on going? Uh, so a little bit more on the uh, instability exam. Uh, there have been a lot of good anatomic studies out there looking at the UCL. Um, Frank and Dobbins found that the average angulation for a non-injured UCL was about 20 degrees in men, 25 degrees in women. And in the pictures here, you can see instability on the picture up the top of the UCL, instability here of the RCL on the uh, bottom picture. Um, further studies show that valgus instability of more than 35 degrees with the joint extension or 30 degrees of flexion was pretty predictive of a complete tear with a high probability of a stenter lesion. Um, but really, if you remember the 30 and 15 number, that's kind of what the majority of the studies in the lecture that I've been through have settled on. And that's all kind of comparing it uh, to the contralateral side. Um, so Kathleen has uh, provided me with some excellent videos because uh, she's a little more forward thinking on it than I am, but here is a uh, UCL test or uh, testing that medial side. And you can see uh, when he tested on the other direction. So obviously moving off to the side, but when he goes the other direction, you can see kind of this firm endpoint. It doesn't go any further. Uh, so that's a great video of that. Um, so for imaging, uh, simple things when they come to clinic, you want to get an AP and a lateral. And then 
specifically something that I really like. I really like stress x-rays and I know Kathleen does as well. And if I suspect any injury here, I'm always going to get a stress x-ray. I will say that I am the beneficiary of having a fluoro room in my clinic pod. So it is very easy to do and takes no time to do that. And I also say it's very helpful to do this because the patient gets to see exactly what you're looking for in testing. And they're really kind of included in this process. And always make sure to injure their non-injured side first. Uh, just so they have kind of an idea of one, what you're doing for comparison, but two, they know what to expect when you're going to their injured side. Um, some people argue that this may displace the ligament or complete a tear, uh, but in all sincerity, I think if you're doing this in a controlled manner in clinic, I think it'd be pretty hard to truly rupture a ligament. Uh, I think if, if you are unstable, that thing had already ruptured. I don't think you're the one who is doing it. Um, some proponents have argued that if you're unable to examine the joint, uh, that you can inject a small amount of lidocaine and then re-examine. I haven't had to do that yet. Um, I feel like it is actually pretty well tolerated, even in the acute setting. Um, if you don't have a lot of experience doing it and your exam is kind of equivocal, I think an MRI can be helpful to determine a complete versus a partial tear. Um, and even patients who have small little avulsion uh, fractures off of uh, the proximal aspect of the phalanx, you can still absolutely stress these patients as well to determine their stability. Uh, so getting into some more fun pictures, um, here's a picture that uh, Kathleen had. You can see that this is quite grossly unstable and how this uh, proximal phalanx is sliding over the metacarpal head. Um, Kathleen actually had an excellent study in JBJS about translation in these injuries where they stressed the MCP radiographically after sectioning parts of the ligament. Um, and, you know, to be honest, I'd always initially thought of these more as a purely angular deformity, but once they section both the proximal or the proper and the accessory collateral ligaments, uh, the proximal phalanx would translate pretty significantly over the metacarpal head. Um, you can see that a little bit of that metacarpal head is uncovered, and I think that's also another helpful thing to look at uh, when evaluating these patients. Uh, so here's a patient I had. Here's his uninjured side. Um, and you can see that he really doesn't move a significant amount. There's very, very little um, valgus movement through his thumb. I mean, he is about neutral with me stressing him there, going from the left at resting to the right. Um, and here's his contralateral side. Um, you can see this is what he looked like before and me after stressing him. You can see that he's opening a little bit medially. It looks like he's sliding off the side and some of that metacarpal head is uncovered. Um, and it's interesting, and I thought this was a perfect picture to demonstrate it, um, is that sometimes when I'm testing these patients under a uh, fluoro, uh, they kind of develop what I call an apprehension sign, kind of like in the shoulder, um, where they kind of get this sensation that something's about to dislocate and they pull their hand back. Um, so this is a picture of me catching him just as he is uh, pulling his hand back. He's like, okay, I understand what you're getting at. I see it's unstable. I hear you. Um, Moving along, here's an RCL stress view that I have here, uh, reasonably neutral there on the right side and there on the left side with us stressing it. You can see that he's translating off of the side, picking up an angulation. A lot of that metacarpal head is pretty uncovered. Um, this was in the uh, Hand Society lecture series and you can see this small little bony fleck. Um, I appreciate them stressing it to be thorough, which you should do, but I think it's pretty clear from the resting position of this thumb that it is going to be grossly unstable, uh, but you can certainly see plenty of angulation there. Um, and, you know, I don't find myself ordering MRIs routinely because we have this fluoro in clinic, um, but here's a patient I had sent to me who had a uh, stenor lesion, and his MRI is here on the left, and here's kind of a representative film on the right of what a stenor lesion looks like. Um, but you can see here in this extra or MRI, you can see kind of this bundled up uh, part of tissue right here on the left. Um, and there really isn't anything else in the thumb that does that. You can see the adductor aponeurosis right here. You can see that there really isn't anything living in this area. Comparable to the other side, you see this nice thick band of RCL. You can see the adductor aponeurosis and tendon kind of on this side. Um, but, you know, as we were talking about earlier in the anatomy of these ligament injuries, um, the ligament, it doesn't just purely run in the coronal plane. Um, it goes you know, dorsal to volar, and you really need to look at it in a couple of different planes because you're not going to get it all in just one. Um, so MRIs are helpful, but they're kind of costly. They take up time. Um, a lot of patients show up to my clinic already with an MRI, which is fine. 
Uh, but if I'm seeing them for the first time, they don't have an MRI and they're grossly unstable, and we can perform the stress radiograph. I really feel like that is all that we need. Um, so ultimately, the treatment for these is truly based on joint stability. Now, so grade one injuries are people who have pain, but really don't have any instability. And you can treat this with mobilization for three to four weeks and then get them moving. Uh, grade two signifies a kind of increase in the injury, partial tears, which there is a little bit of increased laxity. Um, and it's asymmetric compared to the contralateral side, but you still have a firm endpoint. And these don't necessarily need surgery. And you just treat these with the mobilization a little bit longer. But grade three is where you have this kind of significant increase in laxity. You don't have a firm endpoint. You've got a stunner lesion. Um, and these, in my eyes, is, uh, you know, really almost a, uh, an injury of necessity that you need to go in and fix. Having a stable thumb is very, very important to what we do day in and day out, whether you're an athlete or not. Um, so why do we fix these? To improve the stability, improve your grip strength, pinch strength, and hopefully we're limiting some of this post-traumatic arthritis secondary to this instability. So now that we've decided that we've got an injury that we need to fix, how are we going to fix these? Um, so there was a recent 2021 study in JHS that compared suture tape to polymeric reconstruction to suture anchor repair, and then stressed these repairs measuring the force in 15 specimens. Now, on average, the super, suture tape reconstruction, or you repair the ligament and then back it up with this suture, um, was able to demonstrate it required roughly 60 newtons of force to reach failure, as were the other two were at 21 and 16, respectively. Um, so I was primarily taught the suture tape augmentation repair for my training, but it's helpful to have the biomechanics that support that as well. Uh, so here's a picture of uh, some tears here on the left side uh, from the hand society. You can see the ligament was a bolst off uh, from the distal aspect or the proximal phalanx, and you can see it back here. Here's a picture from my partner of a stenter lesion where they just opened up the skin, and you can see the ligament kind of pooching up from the proximal aspect of the aponeurosis there. Um, here is another photo of that where you can see uh, the stenter lesion where the UCL is popped out proximal to the aponeurosis. Um, so how I like to repair these um, and fix these, and I took a lot of these from the Arthrex website, uh, one, because they have a higher production uh, facility uh, available to them compared to what I have. Uh, but this is uh, Steve Shen, um, and this is kind of his starting incision right here. I like to make a curvilinear incision, dorsal to volar. You can see the adductor aponeurosis here, which you split longitudinally. That way you have that to repair later. Um, just before this point, you should see the superficial radial sensory branch here. Make sure to protect it and move it out of the way. Um, otherwise, that nerve will somehow get uh, dinged up, and that is not a pleasant thing to deal with uh, post-surgically. I take it in whatever direction it wants to go in. Um, but ultimately, you just want to make sure you're leaving a dorsal cuff here for your uh, adductor aponeurosis so you have something to repair. Um, here you can see he sectioned off the ligament distally. So this is all the UCL right here. Um, you can see dorsally it's been separated from the capsule. So this is the next layer deep. Um, and this can be helpful to mobilize the ligament. But I think it's also helpful to do because if you're struggling to figure out, um, at least when you were in there, whether or not this thing was a volt off proximally or distally, you can stick a freer within the joint, stress a little bit, and you should get a little bit more give and give you kind of an inclination on where this was a bolt off from. Um, but either way, if you can't get this ligament back to its insertion, this can be a helpful technique here to help mobilize the margins of that ligament and uh, will allow you to primarily repair this even if you're a few months out. Um, here's one of my interop photos so I'm showing my pin placement uh, for my suture anchors. Um, obviously, you can see that I'm angling away from the joints uh, being particularly critical of this x-ray. I probably could be another millimeter or two away from the joint on both of these. Um, but you can also see the gross instability there. And I, I take a, a lot of x-rays, even though it is really, truly just a soft tissue case. I get an x-ray in the beginning to show the instability. Another set of x-rays to confirm my KYR placement. Um, and then another one at the very end just to confirm stability. Um, so here's a picture of that first suture anchor going in if um, this were to have evolved off the proximal phalanx. Um, and you can see the suture tape, which is the thicker uh, suture material, and then the smaller tape, which is a fiber wire. Um, so I'll usually use a one three millimeter suture tape and a two of fiber wire, and I'll repair that ligament down with a horizontal mattress suture. Um, when you're doing that, and this is another one of my partner's uh, photos, um, 
And you have to be really, really uh, careful in where you tension this. Um, so for my primary repair, I try to tension this. I make sure that it is largely neutral, maybe a couple of degrees of uh, owner deviation. Um, and then I put my suture tape in at about 30 degrees of flexion and largely neutral because I don't want to over tension or over constrain the joint. Uh, but very, very important that you make sure that uh, your partner in surgery, whoever's across the table from you, is doing a good job of supporting that thumb so you're not accidentally tensioning it in a position that you're not expecting. Um, so here's kind of what the final product. You can see the suture tape overlying the ligament. You can see the ligament's been primarily repaired down. Um, and certainly in the interest of being thorough, don't forget to close down kind of that dorsal margin right there between the ligament and the capsule. And if you had to separate anything volary, volarly, um, such as separating the uh, proper from the accessory, you want to make sure that you can close that down as well. Um, so here's a final x-ray, uh, just confirming that you have it nice and straight as you were thinking. You didn't over constrain it. So the fun part of these discussions. Um, it was a lot of fun preparing for this lecture, and I'm obviously a product of my training, and my mentors were historically suture tape augmentation for everyone, so that's what I know best. Uh, so in preparing for this and going through all of the return to play and rehab protocols out there, um, it's really impressive how, with kind of the newer techniques, we've been able to speed up this process. Uh, so up here on the top, you have the Greens uh, hand surgery textbook, and it gives a pretty good timeline for a primary repair without any suture tape but it was taking them roughly four months to get back to play. Um, I will say that being said, it's important to know that a lot of people kind of early on when they were repairing these would pin the MP joint for four weeks, which obviously would prevent you from initiating any early range of motion. You'd be casted for that period. Um, but interesting how long it took. Um, Warren Hammer, who's very active in the hand community and is up in Rochester, um, had his patients after a primary repair uh, returning at about 10 weeks or two and a half months after five or six weeks of casting. Um, and then Bobby Chabro, who's been a team doc for the UVA sports team, the UVA study there, uh, published a really good article uh, supporting return to play after a pirate repair. They would cast for four weeks, rehab, and they return to play somewhere around seven weeks. But can, you can see a pretty variable range there. Um, so I think you can probably see the uh, slow direction I'm moving in here and decreasing the time to return to play. Um, so back to the suture tape augmentation, um, Steve Shin's group, uh, who's out of Cedar sinai um, has gotten this down to about five weeks now. And this is starting with very early range of motion in the first week. And they're limiting any wrist-based splinting. And once you have that full range of motion, they start strengthening. And once you start strengthening, you're also permitted to start playing in kind of some of these pos position-specific drills, and you're kind of able to progress as tolerated. Um, and Kramer will go into a bit more detail on my protocol. And I'd say I'm maybe a week behind Dr. Shin for maybe my skill positions on this, uh, but it really and truly is kind of position specific. Um, so, so far in my experience for kind of the skill positions, people in baseball, they're usually asking to go back around that five or six week mark. Um, and really and truly when I'm seeing them around that five or six week mark, they can just about break my hand in a handshake without any pain. And I'm like, okay, you are fine. We can get you back out there. Um, but those are for all the skill position players, um, you know, patient or players who are not in these skill positions. Uh, we can usually get them back pretty quickly within a week or two once their incision is healed, just so long as they're in a playing cast. Um, so before I send you off to uh, Kramer here, here's one last video from my partner. I think this is really, really cool. And I'm doing a little bit of a humble bragging on her behalf. Um uh, so we're about three and a half weeks out of a UCL repair think, on the gentleman who's up to bat. He's going to the judge Big Ten teams when it comes to the tournament. And Deep left field. He just hits an absolute bottom. Uh, so that's not too bad for not even being four weeks out from his injury. Um, so without further ado. What do you think, um, do you think the committee is going to do to try not to play that again? Uh, but we will. Uh, let me stop sharing my screen. We will get Kramer on here so he can talk about what he does best. All right. All right. So my name is Kramer and I am an OT and certified hand therapist. Like they said, I treat for Therapy South out of our um, trustful location and also direct our hand therapy services. So uh, it's an honor to be speaking with everyone tonight about this topic. Um, so my outline here, I'll be defining, you know, what hand therapy is. And then, you know, how to become a certified hand therapist and what that means. 
we'll compare some post-operative protocols. Um, and then we'll also talk about some conservative management. And then I'll describe some considerations for hand therapists and, you know, some things to keep an eye on um, when, you're, when you're talking to hand therapists or if you're a hand therapist yourself. And then describing the benefits of the custom load profile and mobilization braces that we can make. So the American Society of Hand Therapists, you know, they, they describe hand therapy as the art and science of the rehab of the upper limb. And so this does include everything from the neck down to the fingertips. Um, it is a merging of both PT and OT uh, theory and practice. So it's a combination of the two disciplines. And that all came about because there was a need uh, for a specialist to kind of delve further into this, this anatomy and the challenging uh, rehab of these complex uh, areas and injuries. So that's where the CHT exam comes into play. So the Hand Therapy Certification Commission, uh, you know, they, they put out this exam. I think the first one they did was in 1991. And so even though it's a merging of both PT and OT, you can tell by the percent here that it's very OT driven. 87% of CHTs are OTs. Um, personally, I'm an, an OT, so I understand, I understand that. But uh, the occupational part of OT is anything anybody does. So it's very functional, it's very function based. And then the most functional part of the body is the hand. So then I think that's where in turn a lot of us become the CHTs. So, you know, out of all those PTs and OTs in, in the nation, there's only 6,781 CHTs. So there's not too many, of out, too, too many of us out there. So the requirements to sit for the exam is a minimum of three years of clinical experience. Uh, 4,000 hours of direct practice in that field, and then you sit for the exam, and then we, 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 we recertify every five years. So we'll get into some of the post-operative protocols here. You know, with any kind of protocol, you're going to run into hundreds of options out there that are going to vary depending on the surgeon, the therapist, and there's too many factors. So instead of comparing different protocols like that, I, I I'm going to give an example from the Indiana hand protocol book. And, you know, I have the side by side of the fourth edition from 2001 and the fifth edition from 2020. Um, I use Indiana often, but I do think it's kind of conservative um, based on what, you know, I treat typically. But some of the highlights here for this is that the old protocol and a lot of some surgeons still use this. They want people in a forearm thumb spike splint as opposed to the newer protocols are gonna be more hand-based. I'll talk a little bit more about that towards the end, but to me, you know, immobilizing anything you don't need to create secondary stiffness, secondary guarding, and just other issues that you can, you can avoid if necessary. So that's why I like the newer protocols of a hand-based splint option. Um, the comparison of active range of motion, uh, it begins a couple like begins at week three to four on the new protocol and about a week six for the for the older one, and then passive range of motion is also about two weeks ahead in the new protocol, and then strengthening is not necessarily mentioned in the second protocol for some reason, but they're pretty much both around the eight to eight to ten week mark, and then new protocol you return to pinching and resistance stuff at, at week uh, at twelve compared to fourteen. So that brings us to the new protocol, where Stuttermont alluded to. So this is kind of a combination of Dr. Max and Dr. Beaumont's protocol. And so we're starting people a lot sooner. So eight to 10 days, post-op dressing comes off. We put them in that hand-based the hand -based splint. Again, hand-based being the focus with the IP joint free. That means the wrist is free to move. And we go ahead and initiate that active and passive range of motion one thing we do in therapy is we teach them, you know, keep keep the palm, I mean, keep the thumb palmally adducted to not you know, create extra stress to the UCL or the repair. And then with their home exercise program, we also kind of emphasize that, especially with passive motion. And then four to six weeks, we begin the wean out of the splints, begin some strengthening as tolerated. That's heavily dependent on the pain and your motion and just how 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 well each patient progresses. And then from there, we progress six weeks plus to full use, grasping, pinching, uh, and full function. So the big thing here, and kind of going back to Beaumont's point, is that return to sport can be anywhere from one to eight weeks. And that depends on the sport and position of play. So, you know, if it's, if it's a lineman and you put them in the, the club for the games, that's fine. But if it's someone that's going to be swinging a golf club or 
throwing a ball or something like that, they might be a couple, couple you know, further weeks out, more like five, six, seven, eight. But then we'll talk about that when we get to splitting in a second as well. So then for conservative, he, you know, he talked about the grade one and grade two, you know, anywhere from three to six weeks of immobilization. And then we start range of motion and that's gonna be dependent on pain. And then the progress from strengthening and passive and return to activity and sport is gonna be heavily dependent on joint stability and how each patient progresses. And then back to being sport specific and position of play specific. All right, so therapy considerations, these are just some of the things that aren't necessarily always talked about in physician's protocols. It definitely is talked about with therapy protocols. And one of the main, main things is pain. So especially our athletes, they think about no pain, no gain, push through the pain. I, I need to get better as fast as possible to get back on the field or the court or what have you. So one thing I spend a lot of time teaching my patients is pain awareness. So not just identifying unless you have pain somewhere, have, have pain somewhere, but knowing what kind of pain it is. And that kind of that modifies what I do in therapy or what I tell them to do at home or what I'm telling their trainers and coaches to do with them. So, you know, identifying where is the pain? What do you feel? Is it sharp? Is it pulling? Um, because if they can identify that the pain is that is at the UCL or at the repair site, then that's very different than an extrinsic type pain or like, a, or like an IP joint pain. And teaching them early on what they feel and, and where they feel it can help therapists and doctors know um, where they're at in their timeline and how we can progress them. Because if they're just saying, oh, it hurts, and that that's the end of their sentence, then people are going to kind of back off of them, but if they're like, oh no, it's just tight, we can, we can work through that, then we can progress, progress them a lot faster. So that leads into scar mobility. So with any surgery, especially in the hand, you're going to have scar tissue. And in that small of a space, scar tissue can stick to everything. And so we always emphasize early mobility um, and things like that. And then it can be kind of hypersensitive or, you know, in the hand, you're, you're going to have some nerve endings that are going to get a little aggravated. So some patients will have some numbness or tingling. And that leads to proprioception, which some people may think kind of why did I list that under scar mobility. But you think about the bulk of a repair or the bulk of scar tissue, and you're someone who's got a grip of golf club or do something a little more fine motor or just have anything in that web space, that input of the bulk of the scar or the tenderness of the scar or the numbness and tingling, that can alter how you use your thumb. And, you know, with any kind of skilled athlete, you know that every degree of change makes a huge difference in the outcome. So you don't want scar or soft tissue to give that proprioceptive input, like, oh, my thumb doesn't work right. You know, we can work through that and make sure that soft tissue is not getting in the way. And then one of the biggest things that I work on in therapy is the soft tissue extrinsic tightness. And so patients will all describe that when they're making a, making a, making thumb flexion, like in these pictures here. Um, a lot of these patients don't say they hurt at their UCL or hurt at their repair site. They, they might say they feel a strong pull over the dorsal aspect of the thumb from like CMC to IP. And again, that goes back to knowing what they feel. So when they say that, they're, they're basically saying they have this extrinsic tightness, which can come from um, the, the EPL and the APB or APL and EPB. And so we treat that with manual work. And so I list here IASTM. That is instrument assisted soft tissue mobilization. It's a technique that I use often in clinic, but and I have a video of that in a minute as well. But that really gets things loosening up and it really it helps more uh, it decreases pain with movement, decreases scar tissue, decreases tightness, and gets their motion uh, back a lot faster. And then strengthening, yeah, you know, people kind of laugh when we talk about strengthening a thumb. And of course, the most, the best way to strengthen a hand is to use it functionally. So we always promote that. And then outside of that, we do um, we use therapy and other techniques in clinic and at home to get that thumb stronger. Typically, I don't really focus that much on strengthening because I want 100% return of motion first. And you know, I tell patients they can get strength back almost at any point. You, the motion has a has a much smaller window to get that back. And then I do emphasize uh, pain-free strengthening. And when I say that, I mean pain-free at the UCL. So there may be some tenderness and some discomfort, but we definitely want to focus on pain-free strengthening from the UCL standpoint. 
And in some of the older protocols, uh, they, they do mention web space contractures. This is rarer, especially with the newer techniques that Dr. Beaumont's been talking about. But with tight repairs, they might develop that adduction contracture and need a little seed bar splint to wear at night or a spacer to just stretch that back out. But again, that's, that's getting pretty rare these days, thankfully to the new, new, new te techniques. Another thing that we do is kinesio taping. And so this is a great way to wing people out of a brace because you know some people get used to those braces and then they see that as their, kind of their safety blanket. And so kinesio taping allows that support, but also full range of motion and full muscle activation. Sometimes in a brace, patients don't activate the muscles that they're supposed to or that act as secondary stabilizers. And so with tape, you still support the UCL and can prevent extra stress to the repairs while allowing that muscle activation and that, that input of having a little bit of support. They're not just free. And again, like that, that would work well with holding a club or getting back in the game if um, they don't need true mobilization. And then you can see here at the top of the picture, this is one of my guys I saw today actually, but so the, the right hand's uninvolved, left is involved. And so his main complaint is extrinsic tightness. So this kid is a conservative, approach type kid. He did not have a full tear. And um, you can see on the right side, he's reaching MCP crease of the pinky. And on the left, he's only going to the PF decrease. So here's a video of how I assess that soft tissue. And so you can tell the right hand is the involved side and the left is not. So you can see the skin lift. And so all I do is I'm just trying to move that skin. But again, that dorsal aspect of the thumb is very, very important. And so all that tightness, whether it's from swelling or scar tissue or that extrinsic tightness like I talked about, um, it needs to be addressed because that, that's going to pull and resist their thumb flexion and any kind of motion that they need to do. And so that's where I go into the treatment um, to loosen that up to make sure they have that free to move. So here's that I, IASTM treatment. So this basically means we're using a metal tool to get a little bit deeper into the soft tissue and the fascia. And this was a very, this is a demo video. So I do this, I do spend a lot more time on this than I've shown in the video, but I'm also showing how we perform a little bit of scar massage. You can see as I, I'll play it again. You can see when I get to the scar massage, I'm trying to push it, um, distally and it kind of sticks in the middle and so again that's what we're talking about any kind of soft tissue resistance or bulk can give this the, give them the sensation or appropriate steps of input that their thumbs are not right or they don't want something in their web space and things like that so again this is how we treat that extrinsic tightness to get them pain-free motion a lot faster than just saying hey move your thumb and so here are two videos so this is, on the left is range of motion pre-treatment. This actually was taken today by one of Dr. Beaumont's patients. Um, so pre-treatment, you can tell he's really slow to move, um, not real fluid motion, kind of hesitant to go back in full extension. And then after doing some heat and stretch, some instrument assisted and other techniques, we then have the video on the right where he's got a lot more motion. He's got a little bit of a limber going on and that's fine, but you can tell his motion is a lot faster. He's reaching down towards the MCP crease. And again, this is just pre and post treatment in one day. And I believe this guy is about two, two to three weeks out. So that leads us to custom mobilization. So in all the protocols like I talked about, you know, older protocols, more conservative protocols are going to talk about forearm-based thumb spica. And again, I just personally don't see the need to include the wrist and haven't had any issue in, in doing just hand-based with orthoses, which is why a lot of the protocols are going this direction now. So benefits of custom versus like off the shelf or anything like that is that you're, you're, getting, you're getting it fit by, by a hand therapist. So they're in clinic, um, it's, it's custom on the spot. It's gonna fit precisely to the patient. So um, any swelling, any scar tissue, bony landmarks are going to be protected and contoured and it's going to be a lot less bulky and we can control and, and test and retest to make sure it is not blocking the wrist. IP has full motion, fingers have full motion and then 
as we as we see them in clinic and treat them, we can we can modify these splints to adjust for swelling and discomfort, any kind of rubbing. Um, so it can be modified on a on a visit by visit basis instead of just kind of being stuck with what you got. That you know the idea that not not everybody's a small, medium, or large. So a custom fit really makes a difference in comfort and compliance and just kind of buying the whole process. And then later on, if we need to, we can repurpose them for a lower lower profile uh, splint, kind of like the one in the bottom that can be worn under a glove or, uh, you know, during sport, that's gonna be less bulky and not get in the way of, of any kind of, of performance. And then again, going back to some of the older protocols, they mentioned dynamic and static progressive stretching. So we could modify these and add like a rubber band or um, a flexion sling to provide a static progressive stretch at home. But again, that's in my mind a little bit outdated. So if we're getting these patients started a lot faster, then there's no need uh, to even get to that point of being static progressive. And so thermoplastic qualities, um, this is more for therapists, but it's good to know as physicians as well. So they come in different thicknesses. And so the two smaller thicknesses are 1 16th and 3 30 seconds. So the ones that I have um, shown here are my 1 16th. It's a lot thinner um, and it's got micro perforations. So it's going to allow um, air to move in and out. And it's going to fit a lot more contoured to the joints. Okay. And um, it's going to stretch and drape really well as well. So hit the highlights here. So more stable surgery equals accelerated rehab and outcome. Get them moving faster. Get them back to support faster. Hand base versus forearm base is always better. So less secondary stiffness. And then getting in with the CHT, maximize return, return to motion, return to function. And then the fact that these injuries don't have to end the season. Uh, you know, if you get injured in a season, you can, you can get back a lot faster than people used to think. And then always emphasize team-based approach. Uh, so non-ops to hand surgeons, to hand therapists, and back to trainers to get them back to highest function. And that's it. The much sexier portion of the um, of the night, which would be the foot and ankle. Um, certainly, the hand is somewhat important, but far less important than the foot and ankle, which we have to walk on and plays a much bigger, bigger part in our life. Um, all kidding aside, thank you guys for a wonderful job um, in telling us about the hand injuries. And now I'm going to pass it over to Dr. Pitts, my um, uh, esteemed new partner, um, is going to talk about Liz Frank injuries, which are, um, um, if any of you guys know, is a, uh, is a tough injury to deal with. And uh, we're going to pass it along to Charlie and, uh, uh, let him um, tell us all about it. Thanks, Norm. Um, couldn't agree more. Let's uh, let's talk about the foundation of the body. So we'll um, talk about Liz Frank injury. Um, we will start with a little bit of history uh, for those interested. This is uh, the man himself. This is Dr. Uh, Lafranc or, or Liz Frank. He was a um, surgeon in Napoleon's army in the early 1800s, and he first he was the first to describe the Liz Frank injury um, in what he described as a break in the midfoot um, for men in the cavalry. You can kind of see one down there on the right, kind of almost falling off of the painting, getting their foot hung up in the stirrup when they fall off of their horse, um, and that mechanism was what caused the break. Um, Unfortunately, he couldn't do much with these injuries um, because he didn't have x-ray. So we have some, um, we have an edge on him today in, in diagnosing and treating these. Um, <clears throat> but first thing to know um, with these injuries is the anatomy. And, and Liz, the, the term Liz Frank injury is really very broad and it can be narrowed. But in broad terms, the top left picture here is the um, the highlighted in red is the what we would call a Liz, the Liz Frank joint, which is really the TMT joints <clears throat> of one through five, base of the, the first through fifth metatarsals. I think it also, you could argue, includes the navicular cuneiform joints, which are really one row proximal um, to the TMT joints. And then very specifically, um, the base of the second metatarsal and the medial cuneiform make um, what is sometime, sometimes called the Liz Frank joint um, because it is kind of 
considered the keystone of the <clears throat> of the arch of the foot. Um, and so injury or instability in that area causes instability really of the entire arch and of the foot. Um, and on the top right here, we see the, um, that kind of yellow um, blob there illustrates the Liz Frank ligament, which is one of um, three ligaments that spans that joint. And we have some anatomic studies that I think are important to highlight here because um, that Liz Frank ligament being the middle of those, those three on the bottom right. What this anatomic study tells us is, or showed us was that the dorsal ligament when compared to the plantar two um, is much weaker. And so oftentimes when we get laterals or lateral x-rays of these injuries, we'll see dorsal subluxation of the metatarsals, which um, we'll see later and, and is important um, in understanding and fixing these injuries. Um, and then nomenclature here, um, medial column, middle column, lateral column, anatomy, the medial column really refers to the first ray. I don't know if you guys can see my cursor, probably not, but the first ray, so the um, <clears throat> first metatarsal medial cuneiform and first TMT joint, middle column is two and three, um, and then the lateral column includes um, four and five and their articulation with um, the cuboid. And these designations are important because when we um, start to fix these injuries or have um, injuries, the motion arc of the medial and middle column is, is very, very small, kind of on the order of in the single digits of degrees, usually 10 degrees or less, often less than five. And then the lateral column um, can have a range of motion arc of 20 degrees or more. So <clears throat> um, when we fix these injuries, um, we take every effort to avoid fixing or immobilizing in any way with hardware, the lateral column, because that can be very um, debilitating for the patient since that column is so important for kind of negotiating uneven terrain um, and walking. Um, so mechanism of injury here, um, if we look at the top right, the cartoon there kind of, um, and then the picture below it kind of illustrate what we typically see today. Um, in the clinic and, and certainly during football season and, and sports is this plantar flexed foot with an axial load typically on the heel. So we kind of have that plantar flex foot down there in the bottom right with another player landing on top of it. Um, and that force disrupts the ligaments and causes that dorsal subluxation um, of the base of second, but it can really be um, any of these metatarsals. And then bottom left here, we have the more historical or uh, classic injury mechanism of, of the guy falling off of his horse with the foot stuck in the, um, in the stirrup, causing that rotational type injury. Um, and then what do we see? Um, <clears throat> as with any foot and ankle injury, uh, pain with weight bearing, I can't walk, uh, midfoot pain kind of in, in dorsal swelling, which is not extremely common with all foot and ankle injuries, kind of swelling across the midfoot. Um, and then there are really one or two points from this talk that I hope everyone takes home. If you see anyone who has plantar ecchymosis or bruising in the arch of the foot, like this guy does in the bottom right, um, that person, in my opinion, has a Liz Frank injury until, until proven otherwise. Um, so how do we work these up? How do, we, how do we figure out if a person has a Liz Frank injury? I like to start with x-ray. This is not um, an x-ray that you are probably going to see walk into your clinic, but this x-ray does um, illustrate that dorsal subluxation of the metatarsals that we often see. Um, and with x-ray, the even bigger point with x-ray is to get a weight-bearing x-ray um, of the foot. So what I like to start with is um, this AP weight-bearing film of the bilateral feet so I can compare normal to injured. And you can kind of see with... <clears throat> This weight bearing film on the left, we have that sub lateral subluxation of the base of two indicating that dynamic instability. And if you were to get um, a non weight bearing film of this patient, you may not see that instability. So the, the, the weight bearing and the stress of the joint sometimes uncovers um, an injury that you may not see otherwise. Um, <clears throat> and then kind of textbook definition of instability is a greater than um, two millimeter shift, but really I think it's any kind of discrepancy um, or asymmetry in, in your films. Um, also, another important point is that the injury can happen really anywhere in the 
um, in the midfoot. So this, this patient has instability really of his, of his first ray or medial column. Um, so he, you can kind of see on the far left here, he has diastasis uh, at the base of two at the intercuneiform joint. Then he also has some medial subluxation of his um, navicular cuneiform joint or NC1 joint. Um, <clears throat> so don't forget to look at certainly all the TMT joints, but look at your um, small joints in the midfoot to see if anything looks a little bit abnormal. Um, and if I'm still kind of unsure, I will get an MRI. Um, so if I, if I am unable to really diagnose an MRI with, or diagnose a Liz Frank injury with an x-ray, um, I'll get an MRI because oftentimes you can actually see the ligaments um, in the film. And on the left here, you can actually see bottom, the left image, bottom left, you can see medial cuneiform, then you can see base of two and actually see the ligament connecting the two um, there. Um, MRI on the right is actually the scan of this patient. Um, and you can see certainly um, Liz Frank ligament between, between the um, medial cuneiform and the base of two is disrupted, but you can also see that injury in the um, fluid and edema tracking through the intercuneiform joint and out through NC1. So you kind of know that your stabilizers there are, are injured. Um, basic tenets of treatment here. Um, a, person who ha a person who has no displacement on their weight-bearing films, um, intact ligament, you can treat with cast immobilization so, and, and non-weight-bearing. Um, <clears throat> you can be fooled by a person with peripheral neuropathy um, who may have, you know, come into clinic with an x-ray like this and say, you know, my foot is swollen. I'm not sure what happened. Um, that is, yeah, that patient doesn't fall necessarily into the same category as someone with normal sensation. And you may not treat that person operatively, but otherwise, um, ORIF um, or fusion for these injuries. And, and very, very basically, we could spend a whole night discussing ORIF versus fusion, but um, ORIF um, is to stabilize joints and fractures. Um, typically hardware comes out so we can um, let those joints that we have fixed return to their normal range of motion arcs. Um, and then primary fusion is kind of the one and done option where um, we fuse joints, hopefully leave hardware um, in for the foreseeable future, but um, we do lose some of the mobility of the foot. So um, before choosing one <clears throat> or the other here, you really need to consider a the patient um, and their kind of physical requirements, what they want to do and need to do physically with their foot. Um, and then the fracture pattern, the fracture pattern or the injury pattern. So um, you, it's kind of hard to have a one tried and true way for all these injuries. Um, so that's a consideration. All right, this is a case example. And I, yes, I'm not talking about ankle fractures, but I think this case kind of illustrates um, one of my prior points. So this is a 65 year old male. He came into clinic um, he had been hanging some something on the walls in his house the day before, um, fell off of his step stool, kind of crumbled um, on his feet and his ankles underneath. Um, and he came into clinic at, you know, John Doe, right ankle fracture. And, and okay, I agree. But um, talking to him, he says, hey, doc, you know, my other foot really hurts. Um, and it's really swollen. I'm having trouble walking on it. They got some x-rays of it in the, in the, emergency room and they said uh no fracture but i'm really still having a hard time with it um so here these are actually his x-rays from the er um, of his contralateral foot and um you know i think if you are really really studying these you might see a little fleck in the in the liz frank interval on that left picture there's something fishy going on on the on the lateral kind of right at the level of the cuneiforms um but I agree, doesn't look too bad um, until we, and I hope this is the other thing that I hope you take home is the weight bearing x-ray. Um, we stress him with a weight bearing x-ray and we do see that dynamic instability and that lateral subluxation of the bases of um, two, three, and four there. Um, and then the other question is, you know, when do you order MRI versus CT? Um, 
this is the CT of this patient's foot, and you can see that he kind of ended up having fractures of the bases of two, three, and four. Um, so when to order MRI versus CT, um, I think CT is helpful. Um, if you know that there is an unstable Liz Frank injury that needs surgery, there are fractures involved and you need to understand those fractures a little bit better to plan. Um, MRI, I think, is more helpful for either diagnosing a Liz Frank or B, um, in a purely ligamentous injury, it can help you determine um, which ligaments are in or out or which joints are unstable. Um, so this 65-year-old patient ended up getting a um, primary fusion. He says, uh, you know, doc, I really, all I want to do, be able to do is, is get up in my deer sedan this winter. So I don't want to have a whole bunch of extra surgery. So um, we went for a fusion. Um, and you can do that with a combination of um, plates, screws, uh, staples. He got all of the above. Um, in kind of order of operations for these, is I, I like to fix and stabilize the medial column first um, because, because typically you have that lateral and dorsal subluxation of your lesser metatarsals. So if you have a stable medial column, you're able to reduce um, the rest of the foot and the rest of the metatarsals to that stable medial column. Um, other thing, doing primary fusion, if you look at his lateral, he has that little bit of cord out uh, or uh, lucency in his tuberosity. Sometimes I like to take some calc autograft um, and use that to augment the fusion. <clears throat> but um, this is kind of the standard, uh, I would say classic construct for the classic Liz Frank injury or, or instability at the base of two and in the intercuneiform joints. Um, two screws, and these are positional screws. So we get an anatomic reduction of the base of two of the intercuneiform joint um, and fix those with a screw that is not compressing it, is holding those in place, um, letting those ligaments and those joints heal. And then at about four to six months, since this is an ORIF, usually take these screws out. Um, <clears throat> then I included this patient because just to illustrate that these injuries can really come in all shapes and sizes. So this, um, this was also a, a guy in his 60s. He had a big um, heavy piece of steel fall on his foot and it got kind of tangled up underneath it. And so he had this little fracture at the base of one and then shaft fractures of two, three, and four. Um, and, you know, treatment principles, we want stable joints and stable fractures. Um, and it turns out his lesser metatarsal TMT, his lesser TMTs were stable. His first was not. And so we um, fixed fractures and um, fused one. Um, this is a higher energy type of injury. This is from um, days in fellowship, but um, high energy, low injury, still treatment principles are the same. Um, and then that wire through four and five, stabilizing those um, because that is going to come out um, so those can um, regain their, their range of motion arc. Um, staples are a fast way to um, a fast and effective way to, uh, to fuse joints and I think are much faster than, than putting in plates. And I will, I will hustle through rehab here because I know we want to have some time for, for questions. And this is kind of basic rehab principles, um, basic phases. Phase one, um, immediately after surgery, the first two weeks, we are completely immobilized um, in a splint, elevate, elevate, elevate. Um, our goals are to decrease inflammation and restore and preserve range of motion. Um, at the two-week post-op visit, we take the splint down. Um, I like to put patients into a cam boot that I really emphasize wear like a cast and come out to shower and come out to do some active range of motion exercises um, and preserve that um, range of motion so we don't get stiff uh, moving into phase two. <clears throat> Where our goals are these kind of week six to week 12, we want to preserve our and, and, and work on our active range of motion um, and our strength. Um, we do that, and, and really the biggest goal here is weight-bearing progression. We start in the boot um, and progress to weight-bearing unassisted um, during this phase. We can do therabands. We can do open chain strengthening, um, <clears throat> like leg curls and leg lifts, but 
uh, back squats, hang cleans, those type of things with the, with the foot stuck in the ground resistance, um, we, we still avoid here um, unless we progress. And then no, no resistance stationary bike um, for cardio. Um, and then phase three at about the three month mark. And again, this, the return to play process, um, particularly for these types of injuries are, are multifactorial and people move at different speeds, but um, ballpark about 12 months, or excuse me, uh, 12 weeks. Um, we're talking about getting back into close chain strengthening sports specific um, progression back um, to full weight bearing and play. Um, <clears throat> and that is, yeah, I think we have, well, we may not have much time for questions, but anyway, that's, uh, that's it. Thanks, Charlie. Although the foot is clearly less detailed and, you know, demanding than the hand, that was a, a great presentation. Um, one question I had, you know, Chris talked about how the internal brace has really revolutionized treatment for these thumb ligament injuries. Is anyone doing any kind of internal bracing for these Liz Frank injuries at all? Um, some people are, um, I am not, and it is, um, I think the argument is that, um, you could leave it and not have to take it out and it, I, it, it allows for that motion. I am not, um, a big believer in it. I think, a, a screw you is, is positional. It comes out and it allows for anatomic return of range of motion and the tightrope and, and kind of not really tried and true in this situation at, at this point. Um, but there are some people using it. Um, people are trying. I think, all the only, I think the only role for um, the internal brace and the, and in the list Frank world is for the very subtle one. Um, I've used it in rep where I've had a really big guy where I'm taking out the screws and I'm concerned about him displacing if, if you know, down the road. And I've used it as kind of a backup method because it still has some mobility, but I, I honestly have not used it as the primary method of fixation yet. I hadn't adopted that and it doesn't sound like Charlie was trained that way either. So. I heard not, no. You may be muted, Kathleen. I'm, I see your mouth moving. Sorry, I was muted. Um, Zoom fail. Uh, there's a question or a Q&A from the audience about a Liz Frank being treated non-operatively uh, and how you guys manage that. Um, <clears throat> don't see it very often, honestly. Mm -hmm. um, but I think if someone has a, has a truly has a Liz Frank sprain, and you order an MRI, the, they have all of the classic findings, the ligament is intact, um, they need to be, some people treat them in a cast. Um, I think you could treat them in a boot as long as they are treating that boot like a cast, like we said before, and you, and you have a period of non weight bearing. Um, and I would say that should probably be three to four weeks. And then you can begin progressing weight bearing in the boot and progressing out of the boot back into your normal shoes. What's really tough about those is that operative treatment, you kind of have a progression and with non-operative treatment, you don't really know when someone is going to tolerate weight bearing. Um, that's why those are tough. Well said, Charlie. I've, I've got, uh, I'm going to click in on that only because I've probably spent six hours on the phone in the last two days dealing <laughs> with a NFL kid um, who's got this exact scenario. So Charlie in his presentation said that greater than two centimeters uh, or greater than two millimeters indicates instability i would argue with that i would tell you greater than anything and in, in, indicates instability in the list frank but we i have a kid um who truly has a literally non-displaced list frank and it's a list frank um and he's a nfl lineman um and i've spent multiple hours on the phone with him and then with bob anderson up in green bay discussing this and whether or not this kid can be treated non-operatively because there, there's another kid that Bob and I are both handling that is getting treated non-operatively. And it's rare. 
However, the screws that are put in are really placeholders because the ligaments want to heal. And then you pull them out once the ligament heals. And so if it truly is non-operative and you can keep them off of it, there is a role for that. But they have to be very strict in their, in, in their non-weight bearing. And, and you have to be very careful in your post-operative protocol to, or your post-injury protocol. The, the issue there is there is some unpredictability as to what happens when you let them go back, whereas the operative course puts them on uh, a more predictable course, but it does leave you with hardware removal questions and all that kind of stuff. So um, it, it's, it is not a slam dunk and there is a role for it and the ligaments will heal, but you got to be very careful. You got to be very sure and you got to be willing to deal with some of the ups and downs of the unpredictability of non-operative treatment. There's another question from the audience about the longevity of internal brace repairs for thumb UCL. Uh, and I can, I can kind of speak to that. I, I think really it's only been done widespread for about five years uh, across the hand surgery community. So we don't have long-term information. Uh, we have about five years worth of information and they've done well for that standpoint. Um, but no, we don't have long-term information and could there be some sequelae later on? I think it's possible um, there is some concern for bone resorption around the anchors. There's some concern if you over tighten the joint and what that might lead to. Um, but really the short-term benefits have been so dramatic that it's hard to limit yourself for potential like questionable long-term things when the short-term results are, are so, so much better. And I don't know if Chris has any other thoughts on that. Yeah, I uh, echo what Kathleen said there. And even looking at all the papers and the technique guides, I really didn't see anything where people were mentioning anything past a six month follow up. And for these athletes, if they're out there, they're playing, they're stable, they're not having any pain or any symptomatic instability. Um, you know, it's hard for me to bring them back into clinic. You know, it's kind of left open like, hey, if you're able to get back and play and you're not having any problems, I'm not going to bring you back to clinic just to look at you for you to tell me that you're doing okay. Um, but I know Kathleen and I were discussing with uh, one of the residents who's interested. It would be interesting to get some. Uh, long-term data just to see if there's anything radiographically uh, but really and truly I don't follow a ton of these people particularly long radiographically and Kathleen I don't know if you're getting a lot of post-op x-rays on these people but as long as they're stable and they're doing well in the clinic I'm not getting routine x-rays on them unless they're having a problem with it which I really haven't found to be the case. I have a question um, so Drew Brees made headlines for his UCL repair and it's probably one of the more famous UCL repairs that's been done obviously just because of its high profile nature etc um, and he came back fairly quickly and I know there's been you know whether to pin the joint whether or not pin the joint how do you make those decisions number one pin the joint or not um, and then two if you're not going to pin the joint where where does the line fall? And this may not be an easy answer on in return to play, right? Because he, he's playing at the highest level. He's got a grip of football. He's got to put stress on that every single time he takes a snap. And so where do you fall in, in terms of making those decisions? And if you don't pin the joint, how quickly are you let them, letting them go? And, and how where, where do you draw the line on saying, okay, you're okay to go back? I don't think anyone pins the joint anymore uh, in an acute injury. Um, I think that's sort of antiquated at this point. Yeah. Um, you know, maybe in a chronic situation or if you had a patient who was schizophrenic or you really, really couldn't trust them, that might be different, but very, very rarely. Um, and I think return to play is very individualized. Um, as you said, Drew Brees is a, you know, high level athlete. The um, clip that Chris showed of the UAB or no, I'm sorry, Alabama baseball player hitting a home run at three and a half weeks out. You know, those people are very motivated. They've really worked hard. They've had a great rehab team behind them. Um, so I think it can be done. And, and I really, you know, the protocol Kramer showed, I think is very um, typical for our average patient. There are some people we are even more aggressive and really about a week after surgery, we're like, Hey man, go like, go, you know, get your motion back, get your strength back, whatever you can do, like go. And some people really can. And some people just linger a little bit as I'm sure is true. And in, in a foot and angle too. Yeah, I would agree. Um, 
I think pinning's very antiquated, and I think it was certainly something you'd have to consider if you're doing a primary repair maybe early on when we didn't have a whole lot of faith in the suture anchors. Um, but I effectively look at the internal brace, the suture tape, kind of as an internal K-wire, except it gives us the added benefit that it works in a plane of motion that you want it to, and the K-wire can't. Um, Steve Shin, some of the videos I showed you, was the uh, guy out of Cedar Side and I who fixed Drew Brees. And I've seen a whole handful of videos. He loves to show it off um, at some of the uh, hand societies uh, presentations. But uh, he had Drew Brees throwing the ball within the first week after surgery. Sutures were still in. And uh, I mean, I think a lot of that goes to uh, Drew Brees' credit. Um, I think uh, some of our colleagues also took care of his shoulder and said he just had an absolute bomb that went off. And what well, I think he's now the all-time leading yards um, quarterback in all of history now. So I think some of that speaks to him. Uh, but I think you, just like Kathleen said, you have to kind of individualize it to all these players. I had one other question for Chris. You mentioned for the partial, um, sort of the grade one partial that were not unstable, that you immobilize them for three to four weeks. Is that like full immobilization or is that like brace for comfort? Because I typically don't really immobilize them, I guess. Yeah, I've for the first three weeks, I've been very heavily duty kind of locking them down uh, just because we don't have any internal support. So I've actually been casting them for three weeks and usually I come back and I stress them. And as long as they're feeling better, then I get them into hand therapy and we're starting to pretty aggressively move them. And that's maybe leaning more towards my grade twos. So if it's a grade one, I'm like, okay, you hurt maybe a little bit here. It's maybe bothersome. Let's just take it easy here for a couple of weeks and make sure you don't lose any motion. But for those grade twos, I'm a little more aggressive with them and casting them. I have a quick question for Charlie. So the, the list, Frank World, and you, you made this comment earlier. You said that there, you, you could argue ORF versus fusion. Um, and one of the reasons I love having you around is we have a little bit different training backgrounds when it comes to that. I'm a, I'm a fixer, let them see how they do. And if you have to fuse them, you can always fuse them later and you can't unfuse them. Do you believe that you can fuse the athlete and they can still come back um, at a high level, given the fact that that's a relatively immobile joint? And does that color your decision or are you treating the injury and you say, if I have to fuse them, I have to fuse them and then we'll work through it from there. You're muted. Thank you. Um, in the athlete, I would avoid a fusion um, because I think, yes, that fixing the athlete does allow them to develop arthritis or, or, or kind of have problems with instability down the line. I think you also open up um, the door to some other complications with fusion in the high level athlete. I think if you get, um, you know, if you get a plantar flexion malunion of the first, or you have a non-union or you have, um, if you restrict that motion. I think the high level athlete is the person that is going to notice and is going to need it. Um, and so my, my default with an athlete would be to fix um, a Liz Frank. Um, in a lower demand um, person, I would lean towards fusion just so we have, and definitely in an older person, I would lean towards a fusion just to avoid uh, sequential um, anesthesia. Yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, athlete, I would default to fix. Kathleen, do you want to wrap it up? Yeah, if there's no more questions from the audience, just thank you everybody for being here. We really appreciate your time this evening. Thank you to everybody else on this panel. It's been really fun. Even if we had to sit through some foot talks. <laughs> Come on Fair now. <laughs> we appreciate everybody. <laughs> Kathleen, thanks for a wonderful job. Glenn and everybody at ASMI, thank you so much. Uh, these are always educational for me and uh, for, for everybody involved. Charlie, Chris, um, we're glad that... Um, Glad to have you guys here at Andrews. Uh, hey, y'all are wonderful additions to us. Kramer, fantastic job. I know I need, apparently my feet patients may need some OT. So maybe, maybe you're going to become a hand and foot specialist, but uh, thanks for filling us in. And uh, we, we appreciate the work that everybody does. Thank you. Y'all have a wonderful night and Merry Christmas. Thanks, thanks everybody.